Okay, so we're going to talk about obstetrics today, and uh, the topic we're going to talk about is called a complicated pregnancy. So let's get started with the abnormal fetal growth. This is when they're small for gestational age. That is a fetus who is below the 10th percentile for their estimated fetal weight on ultrasound. Now, the smaller the infant, the greater the morbidity and the mortality risk. However, the risk is less than in a premature infant of the same weight. So, to be a premature infant is much worse. So, then you go on to large gestational diabetes, which is a fetus who is above the 90th percentile for estimated fetal weight on ultrasound. Now, LGA, or large for gestational age, includes maternal diabetes, maternal diabetes, maternal obesity, post-term pregnancy, multiparty, advanced maternal age, and some complications include uh, shoulder dystocia, birth trauma, hypoglycemia, jaundice, low APGAR scores, etc. So the management, if the fetus is estimated to be over 4,500 grams in a diabetic mother, or over 5,000 grams in a non-diabetic mother, an early cesarean or induction or labor may be offered. So let's talk about growth restrictions, which may be symmetrical or asymmetrical. A symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction means all ultrasound measurements, either by parietal diameter, abnormal sense circumference, uh, femur length, etc., are proportional or small for gestational age. Now, causes of symmetrical IUGR are genetic and chromosomal maladies. Symmetrical chromosomal symmetrical chromosomal abnormalities. Now, some causes of that, besides the genetic and the chromosomal, is also CMV, rubella, tetradigen exposure, small parental stature, etc. There should be an attempt to identify the cause with a detailed ultrasound karyotype and screen for infection. Now, an asymmetrical IUGR usually presents with the abdominal circumference that is relatively smaller than the head circumference. Just like in pediatrics, weight and height are affected first, and the head circumference is the last measurement uh, to fall off the growth curve. Um, the cause of asymmetric IUGR is a poor placental transfusion. Poor placental transfusion. Or placental transfusion. So the fetus, uh, um, a, a cause of this, a big cause of this one is um, hypertension. Also lupus, cardiovascular disease, tobacco, cocaine. Um, placental causes include infarction and abruption or uh, velamentous cord insertion. And also you can have twin twin transfusion syndrome. Uh, the fetal, the fetus should be monitored with serial ultrasounds, uh, non-stress tests, um, amniotic fluid measurements, biophysical profiles, and Doppler velocometry. So let's talk about amniotic fluid abnormalities. Oligo and polyhydramnios, baby. Let's do it. So the diagnosis of the amniotic fluid index, the amniotic fluid, or AFI, is measured via the what? The ultrasound. It is the sum of the deepest vertical amniotic pocket, which is measured in centimeters in each of the four quadrants of the uterus. So definitions, less than five centimeters,
I'm gonna go hydramnios. Five to eight centimeters. Borderline. Eight to twenty five centimeters is normal. I remember that. Is normal. And greater than twenty five centimeters would be what? Polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios. So, let's talk about polyhydramnios. This occurs when the amniotic fluid is too high. When the amniotic fluid is too high, you get polyhydramnios. Okay? As you can see here, greater than 25 centimeters. Um, it occurs when it is too high. It's usually greater than 2,000 milliliters in late pregnancy. Late pregnancy, I said. Um, you get fetal abnormalities, so associated with the inability of the fetus to swallow due to anencephaly, you get esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistulas. Now, the maternal abnormality associated with it is gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes, you know, can cause a big baby, which could cause polyhydramnios. Complications uh, include increased risk of malpresentation mal and cord collapse due to extra fluid. So oligohydramnios. Um, it occurs when, there, when the amount of amniotic fluid is too low usually less than 400 milliliters, and that's why they would only be 5 centimeters or below dilated. It's associated with the ability of the fetus to excrete urine into the amniotic sac due to the bilateral renal agenesis or posterior urethral valves in males. Oligohydramnios can also be a late sign of fetal hypoxia or acidemia. Chronic hypoxia results in a decreased blood flow to the kidney, which leads to a decrease in output, which leads to oligohydramnios. For this we, for this reason, it is one of the com components of a biophysical profile. Now, for treatment, if the oligohydramnios is associated with preterm mature, premature rupture of membranes and term labor with recurrent viable D cells, uh, the patient may be a candidate for amniofusion with warmed saline. Warm saline. So that's amniotic fluid abnormalities for you. So antiparting bleeding. This is a bleeding early in pregnancy may indicate an SAB in atopic pregnancy or, a, or even a healthy pregnancy with postictal spotting or cervical polyp. Now third trimester bleeding um, is associated with increased risk of prematurity and perinatal mortality is, is more commonly associated with placental complications. Um, the source of bleeding in the third trimester um, may be obstetrical in origin. You could have placenta previa. Placenta abruption. Vasoprevia, uterine rupture, or fetal vessel rupture. Now, other non-obstetrical sources of bleeding include cervical polyps, cancer, and cervicitis. Vaginal lesions or lacerations are, are common. You can also see hemorrhoids or hematuria. Now, uterine rupture occurs in less than 0.1% of pregnancies, 
but when it occurs, it can be catastrophic. It's a uterine rupture is most commonly associated with a prior uterine scar, okay? However, other causes include trauma, improper oxytocin use, or placenta previa, or placenta percreta, or placenta percreta, or an invasive mole. Many obstetricians will not encourage a vaginal birth after a cesarean section due to the increased risk of uterine rupture. Now, how do you diagnose this? Well, diagnosis is uterine rupture is associated with a sudden onset of severe abdominal pain, <clears throat> an abnormal uterine contour, and the disappearance of pre uh, presenting fetal parts like fetal heart tones and contractions. Now, treatment involves laparotomy with immediate repair of the ruptured site or hysterectomy and delivery of the fetus. The risk of recurrent rupture is extremely high. Complications include hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, although mother uh, and fetal mortality is low in a hospital setting. Another rare cause of late bleeding of, uh, is vessel, fetal vessel rupture. Now, risk factors of this includes, number one, multiple gestations, same as, same as urine rupture, multiple gestations, a villaminous cord insertion, where the vessels do not insert directly into the chorionic plate, but instead insert between the amnion and the chorion and are left unprotected. You also have vasoprevia, which are fetal vessels that cross the internal cervical os. Now, diagnosis is often made with vaginal bleeding and an abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. Um, the app test The app test can be used to distinguish fetal blood from maternal blood. Now treatment is, is with would be obviously what? Emergency C-section. Complications include fetal mortality can be as high as 50% with fetal vessel rupture. All right, very good. So we're moving on to diabetic complications. A lot to talk about here. Diabetic complications. So, maternal diabetes can cause something called caudal regression syndrome. Caudal regression syndrome. It's a rare but severe neural tube defect classically associated with poor glycemic control in a mother during pregnancy. So, diabetes during pregnancy is often classified according to the white classification. Now, that is, class 1A is gestational diabetes with the diet uncontrolled. Class A2 is gestational diabetes that's insulin controlled. Now, class B is onset at age 20 or older or duration or less than 10 years. Class C is onset at 10 years and 19 or duration of 10 to 19 years. And that's how you can see all the way down. It goes to A, A1, A2, B, class C, class D, class E, class F, class R, class RF. Class H, which is ischemic heart disease, so I'd remember that one. And Class T, which is a prior renal transplant. But they're not going to test you on that on the boards. While type 1 and type 2 diabetics are often um, diagnosed prior to pregnancy, gestational diabetes first manifests during a pregnancy. The human placental lactogen level increases during pregnancy and acts as an anti-insulin agent, increasing insulin resistance during pregnancy. So it is the human placental lactogen that is causing the gestational diabetes. The glucose loading test is a screen for gestational diabetes. The glucose loading test is a screen for gestational diabetes and is performed between 24 and 28 weeks. The woman is given a 50 gram uh, glucose drink, blood sugar, and is checked one hour later. If the value at one hour is greater than or equal to 140 milligrams per deciliter, a glucose tolerance test is performed. Now, a glucose tolerance test of a woman's fasting blood sugar is measured. Then she is given a 100 gram loading dose, and her blood sugar is tested at one, two, and three hours. 
The test for positive gestational diabetes if two or more of the following are elevated. Number one, the fasting glucose is greater than or equal to 95 milligrams per deciliter. Number two, the one hour glucose is greater than or equal to 180. The two hour glucose is greater than or equal to 155. And the three hour glucose is greater than or equal to 140. Risk factors for gestational diabetes include being Hispanic, Asian, or Native American. So that's the people you're going to see this in. On the boards, they could throw a uh, Chief Tonto coming in at you, and you could see they could tie it into caudal regression syndrome. And you'd be like, what the hell? But that, now you see the connection there. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, a uh, Native American descendant, um, advanced maternal age can do it. Obesity, prior fetal macrosomia, prior fetal macrosomia and a family history of type 2 diabetes. So greater than one-third of women with gestational diabetes will develop type 2 diabetes within 10 years of delivery. Greater than one-third. So some treatment. Some treatment of some women can control gestational diabetes with diet and exercise alone, but others must start an insulin regimen with the goal of controlling maternal blood sugars. The fasting blood sugar goal is less than 90 milligrams per deciliter and the one hour postprandial goal is less than 140 milligrams per deciliter. Now, 80% of patients can achieve euglycemia by following the American Diabetes Association of weight and walking, um, dying and walking. Oral hypoglycemia is controversial, but glybutyride is a class B, does not cross the placenta, and has been used successfully to control sugars. Now, fetal macrosomia increase the risk of shoulder dystocia and may be necess necessary at delivery at 39 weeks. Type 1 and type 2 diabetics are almost always uh, require insulin, and diabetes can cause complications for both the mother and the fetus. The obstetrical complications include polyhydramnios. And preeclampsia. The maternal complications include hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis, worsening renal disease, worsening renal disease, and retinopathy. And retinopathy. Fetal complications include macrosomia, IUGR, and SAB. Now, complications in the neonate include hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, polycythemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and RDS, respiratory distress syndrome. So that is the diabetic complications uh, on the fetus and the mother. Now, let's talk about the topic pregnancy or a pregnancy occurring outside of the uterus. The topic pregnancies, they're never fun. Now, okay, the etopic embryos will ultimately grow and invade underlying tissue, most commonly causing peri peritonal rupture, leading to a hemiperitoneum or an acute abdomen. Hemoperitoneum. Acute abdomen. All right, most often occurs in the ampulla, ampulla of the fallopian tube. 
It can also occur in the ovary, peritoneal cavity, and cervix. Risk factors uh, include the most common cause of scarring from uh, chronic salpingitis or P pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, other causes include a history of prior atopic pregnancy or prior tubal surgery. Now, a heterotrophic pregnancy is a multiple gestation with at least one intrauterine pregnancies and one atopic pregnancy. That's a heterotrophic pregnancy. Now, the risk of this is small but increases with IFV if multiple embryos were used. Now, the clinical presentation would be a sudden lower abdominal pain, uh, vomiting, or maybe so it might be mistaken for appendicitis. Um, Add an axial tenderness, uterine bleeding greater than six weeks beyond LMP. Urine pregnancy tests must be ordered. However positive, however, positive results does not exclude appendicitis. Now, a serial HCG is used to screen for suspected etopic pregnancy. Serial HCG is used to screen for suspected etopic pregnancy. Um, HCG levels generally rise at a lower rate or a slower rate than normal in pregnancy. Because of this, serum HCG levels can be compared to the normal if atopic pregnancy is suspected. Inappropriately low HCG levels leads to likely atopic pregnancy. So low HCG. Atopic pregnancy. Atopic pregnancy. Now, note, inappropriately high HCG levels would lead to what? From what we've talked about. Molar pregnancy. Molar pregnancy. Now, diagnosis is confirmed with ultrasound, and you get a lack of intrauterine pregnancy. The ring of fire is the classic finding on ultrasound. The ring of fire The ring of fire is the classic finding on ultrasound and describes the increased vascular flow to the adenexa when color doppler is applied. Now, complications. Hypovolemic shock from intraperitoneal bleeding is the most common cause of hematosalpinks. Um, the fetus almost never, ever survives with atopic pregnancies. But we have to worry about hypovolemic shock in the mother. Um, so how do we manage this? Well, if the atopic pregnancy has ruptured, the first goal is to stabilize the patient with what? IV fluids, blood, and pressors as needed before taking her to the operating room uh, for exploratory laparotomy to stop the bleeding and reset the atopic pregnancy. Now, if the woman has an unruptured etopic pregnancy and there is no fetal heartbeat, methotrexate, methotrexate, boys definitely could throw that at you, methotrexate, I forgot the X, methotrexate is the treatment of choice if you have an unruptured etopic pregnancy and there is no fetal heartbeat. Hit them with methotrexate. That's the treatment of choice if it is unruptured. So that is a topic pregnancy for you. So let's talk about gestational trophoblastic disease. So gestational trophoblastic disease. Boy, do we got a lot to talk about here. 10% of molar pregnancies are partial hydatiform moles. Partial hydatiform moles. Okay. 10% of molar pregnancies are partial hydatiform moles. And that's when two sperm simultaneously fertilize an egg, a, a process called didandry. That's when two sperm uh, simultaneously fertilize an egg. So that leads to an abnormal placenta, which leads to an abnormal fetus, which is ultimately non-viable. Um, you get the triploidy. The triploidy 69XXY. 69XXY. The 23X from the mom and the duplicated set from the dad is most common. 
Tetraploidy or higher multiples are possible if greater than two sperm fertilize an ovum. Now, let's talk about molar pregnancies. These are benign uh, gestational trophoblastic disease or benign uh, GTD. Now, the gross and microscopic examination for you have a complete and an incomplete mole. A complete mole, um, all hydropic, hydropic chronic villi resemble a cluster of grapes. Cluster of grapes um, with severe trophoblastic hyperplasia. Now an incomplete or a partial mole, uh, you have fewer hydrophic chronic villi, so you have minimal trophoblastic hyperplasia. Now the diagnosis in um, prognosis of a complete mole this in here. The diagnosis and prognosis of a complete mole is number one, increased serum HCG levels. Um, and you suspect it if it's greater than 100,000. That's your number right there, it's 100,000. Um, it's got a high malignant potential. It's got a high malignant potential. Now, a partial mole, you only see normal to only slightly elevated IC, uh, HCG. HCG, and it is not diagnostic, so there's a lower uh, malignant potential here. There's a lower malignant potential there. Now, um, with a com what is what is the most common precursor to choriocarcinoma? That would be a complete mole. Remember I said they have a malignant potential. However, a complete mole is more likely to undergo malignant transformation into a persistent invasive mole than into a choriocarcinoma. Treatment of a complete or partial mole, a partial mole is DNC. DNC. Dil dilatation and suction curatage. Now, RDH is expressed, or RHD, RHD is expressed on trophoblastic cells. So the administration of ROGAM, which is RH immunoglobulin, ROGAM, at the time of evacuation by dilatage and suction curatage. You follow the HCG levels, and if they persist, the elevation suggests an invasive or an invasive mole or choriocarcinoma. Fortunately, these malignancies have an excellent response to, you got it, methotrexate. Methotrexate. Now, 90% of molar pregnancies are complete. I data form molds. Let's erase this. Ninety percent of molar pregnancies are complete. Complete hydatiform moles. Complete hydatiform moles where one or two sperm fertilize an empty egg. So all genetic material is paternally derived. Paternally derived. So you get a duplication of the haploid sperm 
which leads to all placenta and no fetus, okay? That is a complete hydatiform mold. 90% um, of complete molds are the result of fertilization uh, of an empty egg by one sperm. 90%. 90% are an empty egg plus one sperm. Now the product is 46XX, 46XX due to duplication of the haploid sperm. Now 10% of complete moles result from the fertilization of an empty egg by two sperm. Now, these products, products can be either 46XX or 46XY due to disparity. Now diffuse trophoblastic hyperplasia, you see an increased beta HCG level um, relative to the values observed in normal pregnancy but less common um, but less common but classic symptoms of complete moles include uh, hyperemesis gravidarum which is extreme morning sickness um, preeclampsia before 20 weeks gestation fecal luteal we're going to talk about this later but fecal luteal, fecal luteal ovarian cyst and hyperthyroidism. Now, why would hyperthyroidism be on there? Because HCG is an analog of what? LH. LH has the same alpha subunit as TSH. So the increase in HCG levels in complete moles may cause hyperthyroidism. Now let's talk about uh, chorionocarcinoma, which is malignant gestational trophoblastic disease. Obviously, you want to see a crazy increase in HCG. Um, Chorionocarcinoma is associated with an increased frequency of theca lutein cyst. Theca lutein cyst, because theca lutein cyst are stimulated by what? HCG. So that would make sense. Gestational chorionocarcinoma expresses placental antigens capable of evoking a maternal immune response. So it's strikingly responsive to chemotherapy like methotrexate with 100% remission in high cure rates um, versus a non-gestational non chorionocarcinoma, which is much more stubborn and unresponsive during therapy. So that is gestational trophoblastic disease in a nutshell. I know that's a lot, but... That right there is pretty much what you need to know. Yeah, and uh, like I said here, all placenta and no fetus, 90% of molar pregnancies are complete hydatiform moles. We have all placentas and no fetus. And look for this. Everything is done off this HCG. Everything is done off that HCG. So let's talk about hypertension complications. Now, gestational hypertension is defined as the onset of blood pressures over... 140 over 90 um, beyond 20 weeks gestation. Beyond 20 weeks gestation um, that return to baseline after delivery. And they remember, there is no protein in the urine. Um, these patients can be managed expectantly, but are at an increased risk for developing what? Preeclampsia. They're at an increased risk for developing preeclampsia, which is defined clinically as hypertension. plus proteinuria, hypertension plus proteinuria with or without edema, which developed during the third trimester. Now, definitive treatment for preeclampsia or eclampsia is delivery of the baby, because the baby is the one who started this whole thing. It's usually ischemia to the baby that starts this. In less severe illness, you have symptomatic treatments, including bed rest, salt restriction, and monitoring the treatment of hypertension. So what is eclampsia? Well, it's the same thing. You just add one thing, grand mal seizures. You just add some grand mal seizures to the preeclampsia triad. It affects about 7% of women from 20 weeks gestation to 6% to, to six weeks postpartum. So before 20 weeks suggest a what? 
molar pregnancy or a high data form mole if it's before 20 weeks. So um, remember, it affects 7% of women from 20 weeks gestation to 6 weeks postpartum. There's an increased incidence in patients with pre-existing diabetes mellitus, hypertension, chronic renal disease, and autoimmune disorders. The etiology involves placental ischemia, as we talked about earlier, secondary to the lack of trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arteries in the myometrium. Clinical symptoms include blurred vision, abdominal pain, edema of the face and extremities, altered mental uh, mentation, and hyperreflexia. The presence of seizures makes the diagnosis eclampsia. Laboratory findings may include, what do you think, thrombocytopenia? Thrombocytopenia and hyperuricemia. And hyperuricemia. Eclampsia is a medical emergency requiring intravenous two things. Mag sulfate plus diazepam. Mag sulfate plus diazepam. Now, it can be associated with something called the HELP syndrome, which stands for hemolysis. Hemolysis, elevated LFTs. Elevated LFTs and low platelets. Now, the help may be present with nausea and vomiting and epigastric pain secondary to the distension of the liver capsule. Now, there's prominent delivery regardless of, of gestational age. Maternal corticosteroids may help with liver function and thrombocytopenia. So what is the complication of HELP syndrome? Well, DIC, you said it. DIC, hepatic rupture, fetal demise. Demise. So HELP syndrome is not, a, is not a good thing. And then we get into chronic hypertension. That's defined as hypertension that has existed prior to conception, um, deliv uh, developed before 20 weeks gestation, or persists six weeks postpartum. A baseline ECG and 24-hour urine protein should be obtained to rule out pre-existing complications of hypertension, including heart and renal disease. Now, the treatment in these women is they are already on antihypertensive or in women with blood pressures persistently elevated above 140 over 90, you use labetalol. Use labetalol and nifedipine. Use labetalol and nifedipine. Uh, are the drugs of choice. Now, one, one out of three women with chronic hypertension will develop superimpo superimposed preeclampsia. So that is your hypertension complications. Now let's talk about the IFUDs, the intrauterine fetal demise. Now, while fetal death before 20, 20 weeks is termed a miscarriage, um, fetal death after 20 weeks is termed fetal demise or stillbirth. Now, diagnosis is expect, suspected with the lack of fetal movements and no uterine growth and confirmed with the ultrasound. That's how you confirm it. So the risk factors include placenta abruption, placenta abruption, congenital abnormalities, Genital abnormalities, post term pregnancies, post term pregnancies, placental insufficiency, and 
due to immunologic or thrombotic events. Now, most of their time, um, most of the time there is no explanation and the fetal death is attributed to a cord accident. It's usually to a cord accident. Cords choking up or the, the fetus. Now, the management <clears throat> is delivery is indicated due to the risk of what? DIC. DIC uh, from a retained fetus. So labor is induced with prostaglandins. Prostaglandins and or oxytocin. Oxytocin. Now, investigating the cause of IFUD is an important part of helping the family to cope and and workup should should include perinatal autopsy, karyotyping, placental evaluation, syphilis screening, and a thrombophilia workup if suspicious. Now, let's talk about immunizations. This is if an RH negative woman has a positive RH antibody screen. Antibodies must be followed every four weeks. Now, the antibody titers of one to, uh, one to ratio of 1 to 16 and greater can lead to fetal hydrops or hydrops fetalis. Hydrops fetalis. If the titer is 1 16th or greater, serial amniocentesis is performed to measure bilirubin in the amniotic fluid. Okay? So we're looking for hemolysis. If the fetus is determined to have anemia, um, an intrauterine transfusion can be performed. Now, the ideology is the RH sensitization results from the RH negative woman carrying an RH positive fetus. So that's pretty much how this happens. And the hemolysis of the second fetus leads to hydrops fatalis, where they go into heart failure, ascites, uh, diffuse edema, pericardial effusion, etc. Now, to prophylax, to prophylax this, you have, if you have an Rh-negative woman who has no Rh antibodies, the goal is to keep her unsensitized throughout her pregnancy. This is achieved through giving Rogam. Rogam. Um, at least 28 weeks at least 28 weeks after delivery if the neonate is positive. The standard dose of program is sufficient to cover 15 milliliters of fetal RBCs enough in a routine pregnancy. Um, so 15 milliliters, just in case you ever asked about it. Um, more must be given in the case of what? Placental abruption. The central abruption. Now, you also have something called the Kleinenhauer Beck test. Kleinenhauer back test. Now this test is to determine the amount of fetal RBCs in maternal bloodstream. The Kleinenhauer back test. That test is used to determine the amount of fetal RBCs in the maternal bloodstream. So that takes us right into multiple gestations. A multiple gestation pregnancy may result from one or more zygotes. Uh, you have dizygotic twins, which are fraternal twins that arise from two zygotes and are dichorionic. They are dichorionic, so they have two placentas, or they, you can also have two placentas, which is dichorionic, or you can have diamnionic, which is two amniotic sacs. Um, monozygotic twins, um, aka identical twins, arise from one zygote and can be dichorionic. Dichorionic, diamniotic, they can be monochorionic, 
monochorionic, diamniotic. They can be monochor, and that is if the cleavage occurs between four to eight days, they can be monochorionic, diamniotic. Now, if the cleavage occurs within three days of conception, they're dichorionic, diamniotic. If they are monochorionic, monoamniotic, the cleavage is between nine and 12 days, and they are conjoined twins if the cleavage occurs after, does anybody know? After 12 days. They are conjoined twins after 12 days. They are conjoined twins. Now, the risk factors for multiple gestation pregnancies include a family history and reproductive assistance. Now, the good old baby is clomiphene citrate or clomid. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator and inhibits the negative feedback of estrogen and results in an increase in FSH. increase in FSH and this may lead to the growth of more ovarian follicles and multiple ovulations and is responsible in part for the increasing number of twin pregnancies. The implantation of multiple embryos in, in vitro fertilization may lead to higher uh, order multiples. So complications of uh, multiple gestation pregnancies include preeclampsia, anemia, um, preterm labor, placenta previa, congenital anomalies, postpartum hemorrhage, but also TTTS, which is twin-twin transfusion syndrome. That is a result of disproportionate blood supply and monochorionic multiples. The donor twin has a decreased blood volume, is small, and a low urine output resulting in, you tell me, <coughs> if he's got a low urine output, he's going to have oligohydramnios right? Low amniotic fluid. Now the recipient twin has an increased blood volume, becomes occasionally hydropic, and has increased urine output resulting in polyhydramnios. The mortality rate is high and frequent ultrasounds should be performed to diagnose this early. Now the management, the management of the multiple gestations are followed by a high-risk obstetrician. Cesarean uh, delivery is indicated unless both twins are in a vertex position. So, no vertex position or no cesarean section. Now, you watch for postpartum hemorrhage secondary to uterine atony from a distended uterus. So, they can get uterine atony. From a distended uterus and postpartum hemorrhage is what you watch for secondarily. And that takes us into non-obstetric complications of pregnancy. Hyperemesis gravidarum is the most severe uh, form of morning sickness. To diagnose this, you have a woman that loses more than 5% of her pregnancy weight and develops electrolyte abnormalities as a result of being unable to maintain adequate nutrition secondary to nausea and vomiting. Treatment includes IV hydration, electrolyte replacement, and antiemetics. A molar pregnancy must be ruled out as the extraordinarily high levels of HCG can lead to hyperemesis gravidarum. Now, the hypercoagulable state of pregnancy puts a woman at increased risk for thrombotic events. And so she could have DVTs, she could have PEs, um, remember estrogen is a muscle relaxant, so the treatment of DVTs and PEs during pregnancy would be what? Heparin. Or low molecular weight heparin. A massive PE may be treated with streptokinase. Bust up that clot. Streptokinase. Now, Coumadin crosses the placenta and is contraindicated. It can lead to nasal uh, hypoplasia and CNS and uh, skeletal abnormalities. A thrombophilia workup should be performed in a pregnant or postpartum woman with a DVT or PE and women with a significant history of multiple lost pregnancies. So you must rule out a factor V Leiden deficiency. Factor V Leiden deficiency, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, 
hyperhomocysteinemia. Um, Antithromin-3 deficiency. And protein C or protein S deficiencies. So, that takes us right into perinatal infections. Looks like your torch infection is to me. With the perinatal infections, we're going to start with the uh, Listeria monocytogenes. Now, this is usually from soft cheeses or underpasteurized milk that are often infected with Listeria monocytogenes, and that leads to amniotis. Amnionitis, which leads to neonatal sepsis and then what does that lead to meningitis um, and that usually causes a spontaneous abortion uh, rubella generally presents with the triad of what you tell me Rubella has a very specific triad to it. Rubella presents with a PDA, PDA, cataracts, cataracts, and sensorineural hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss. PDA cataracts, sensory neural hearing loss. That is the rubella triad. So, what do we know about Toxmoplasma Gandhi? We know about Gandhi, don't we? But we're not talking about him. We're talking about Toxoplasma Gandhi. So, what do we know about him? He is a protozoan parasite. We talked all about this guy under the uh, parasitology section of these videos. So if you want to know more about Toxoplasma gondii, uh, refer to that. Um, and he's a protozoan parasite found in cats. Cats is a big one. And undercooked or contaminated meat. Now, if a pregnant woman without previous exposure, without previous exposure becomes infected, Toxoplasma gondii protozoa may cross the placenta, causing perianal or perinatal death, or i.e. miscarriage. Perinatal death. Or if the newborn survives to birth, he or she may manifest the classic triad of congenital toxoplasmosis. And that is chorioretinitis number one. Number two, hydrocephalus or macrocephaly. We're going to talk about why we get each one of these here in a second. Number three, intracranial calcifications. So, Chorioretinitis, you're going to see a cotton-like uh, yellow, a cotton-like white yellow scar on the retina, okay? Now, with macrocephaly, the CNS inflammation may scar off the foramen of, foramina of Lushka and Magendi and therefore obstruct CSF outflow. So, therefore, you're going to lead to hydrocephalus, which is going to lead to macrocephaly. Note, 
this sequence of events does not always occur. However, there are been there have been uh, cases of microcephaly in newborns with congenital toxoplasmosis. So, but 90% of the time they're going to be mac they're going to have macrocephaly. The intracranial uh, calcifications. This is the big one they love to go for on the boards. Um, it's ring enhancing lesions. It's ring enhancing lesions. Remember that because you will see this on boards one, two, and three. They just won't say ring enhancing lesions. They may they may call it a, a glioma or something, you know. But it's a it's a ring enhancing lesion, and this one with toxoplasmosis is in the cortex and the basal ganglia on the head CT. They don't really the cortex ones are obvious, but look watch out for those basal ganglia on the head CT. Okay, so that's toxoplasma gondii for you. CMV is the most common fetal infection. Most common fetal infection. The signs and symptoms that may be present at birth but resolve within the first few weeks of life is thrombocytopenic purpura. I know that sounds like a big word, but you've heard of it. It's the blueberry muffin rash, the blueberry muffin babies. It's similar to the rash of congenital who? Rubella. So you also see hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice. Hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice. Now, signs and symptoms that can be permanent and devastating is microcephaly. Microcephaly versus macrocephaly, secondary to hydrocephalus and congenital who? Toxoplasmosis, very good. Uh, mental retardation is number two. Number three, intracranial calcifications that are periventricular. See how they like to play word games with you? Periventricular, intracranial calcifications. And number four, seizures, which would make sense, right? Why would this kid be having seizures if he had a periventricular intracranial calcification if your attending asked you? Well, you would say, Dr. Johnson, uh, the reason this kid's having seizures is because he's got a mass effect in his brain kept creating an ischemic environment. Therefore, when you create an ischemic environment, you shut down the sodium potassium ATPase. Therefore, potassium rushes out of the cell. Eventually, the cell swells because sodium is getting trapped within it, which pulls chloride, which pulls water. The cell bursts, the cell lights, the cell is swelling. It's the first thing we're going to see, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and the cell would be more likely to depolarize because there's more sodium in the cell, and that's going to lead to seizures. In this child. So that is how you would impress your attending if it ever asked about CMV and uh, being the most common fetal infections. I guarantee you, you are going to be asked about it. That's a given. So, herpes, uh, and you, yeah, seizures likely are due to the intracranial calcification. Sorry, I, I should have talked about those. And uh, the deafness or the, is sensorineural. Um, it's seen also in congenital rubella. The intracranial calcifications, which are periventricular, versus the intracranial calcifications distributed throughout the cortex and basal ganglia in what? Congenital toxoplasmosis. Very good. Um, and so now let's talk about the herpes simplex virus, HSV. This is a transplacental infection that can occur with the primary infection resulting in IUGR, microcephaly, or SAB. Now, it's more, more commonly HSV is transmitted as the neonate passes through the birth canal and results in 50% 50% mortality. Fifty percent mortality. That's quite a high number there. Fifty percent mortality. 
Neonates who survive can have mental retardation, pneumonia, hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, and petechiae. Um, a cesarean section should be performed prior to or soon after the rupture of membranes to prevent transmission if genital HSV lesions are visible at the time of labor. Um, now let's talk about the good old streptococcus or streptococcus pneumonia. Streptococcus or group B strep colonized in about 30% of women. Group B strep, as I was saying, colonizes 30% of women, of women, and women it colonizes them in their colon. Women are screened for group B streptococcus um, at week 36. Week 36 with a vaginal or rectal swab and are treated with IV penicillin. IV penicillin and um, if the mother now yeah yeah if, uh, if they're treated with IV uh, penicillin during labor if they're positive for group B strep obviously now if they're penicillin allergic what do we use um, we can either use clindamycin clindamycin or erythromycin, so the macrolides. The macrolides. Now, if the mother is not treated, one in 500 infants will develop an early or late onset infection or sepsis. That's one in 500 if she's not treated. That's a lot. Early onset infection is more common and results in pneumonia. sepsis pneumonia and sepsis within hours to days of delivery late onset infection occurs seven or more days after birth and usually results in neonatal you got it meningitis big problem neonatal meningitis 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 so placenta accreta into the placenta cool things. There's so many placenta per accreta, accreta, increta, placenta previa, placenta abruption, all that stuff. So let's talk about So placenta accreta is when the placenta is implanted in a direction in the superficial myometrium, which is the which means the decidual layer is defective. Now the risk factors for placenta accreta. Number one is endometrial inflammation. What will the second risk factor be? Scarring. Scarring from uh, prior C-sections, etc. Now, risk for impaired placental separation after delivery leads to a massive postpartum hemorrhage, which usually requires what? A hysterectomy. Massive postpartum bleeding usually requires a hysterectomy. Now, placenta increta is when the placenta invades the myometrium versus placenta percreta, where the placenta invades through through the myometrium into the uterine serosa. Remember, the depth of placental invasion is in alphabetical order with placental accreta the most shallow and placenta percreta invading as deep as the bladder. Okay? So it goes in alphabetical order if you ever forget that. From uh, least bad to really bad. So the next thing we're going to talk about is placenta previa. Speaking of him. So first of all, let's, I want to talk about management um, before I talk about placenta uh, previa. Um, you follow the pregnancy closely and delivery via a C-section to avoid maternal bleeding. So you want to do a C-section. That's important, and I like to ask that. And you follow the delivery closely. Now, complications from, from uh, placenta uh, previa include hemorrhage,
hemorrhage, PPROM, preterm delivery, and increased risk of hysterectomy with delivery. All right, it can coexist with placental accreta, placenta accreta, um, and usually presents with painless bleeding in the third trimester. Painless bleeding in the third trimester. So what do you do? You do not, 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 you do not perform a pelvic exam. You do not perform a pelvic exam. Now, what do you use to diagnose it? You use an ultrasound. Use an ultrasound. Now, history of previous cesarean uh, delivery is a risk factor. So other risk factors include prior placental previa, multiparity, advanced maternal age, smoking is a big one, um, and multiple gestations as well. Now, placenta previa, placenta previa is when the placenta attaches to the lower uterine segment, okay, where it may cover the cervical eyes. That is placenta previa, where it attaches at the lower uterine segment, which may cover the cervical eyes. So placenta, the treatment for this guy is deliver the baby immediately. Deliver the baby immediately. The fetal mortality rate obviously is very high. Now to diagnose this, you get a placental abruption that presents with painful, painful, painful uterine bleeding. All right, and tetanic contractions. Tetanic contractions in the third trimester. That's huge. Because that's when these things are going to occur. So the third trimester. Now, do you think you perform a pelvic exam? Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not perform a pelvic exam. You diagnose it again with the ultrasound. Now this sucker right here, this is important, so make sure you hear me. This thing may be associated with disseminated intravascular coagulation. So placenta abruption also can be with DIC. That can be a test question, promise you. Test question. Placenta abruption can be associated with DIC. Now, abruptio placenta or abruptio placentae is retroplacental clot that causes premature separation of the placenta from the endometrial implantation site. Now, the number one risk factor for this guy um, is hypertension. Hypertension is the number one risk factor. I've got smoking here is a big one, but also hypertension is the big daddy. Um, smoking is a big one, cocaine use, um, previous abruption, older mother, etc. Now, the maternal trauma, especially like motor vehicle accidents, can lead to placenta abruption as a result of the deceleration forces. So that's what placenta abruption or abruptio placenta is all about. And lastly, that brings us now I'm going to be doing a lot of talking in this one more so than writing. So there's just there's just some things we need to discuss. The etiology, a major a first trimester um, SABs, which is spontaneous abortions, SAB, so SABs, are the result of chromosomal abnormalities in the first trimester. Other risk factors for SAB include maternal, anatomic defects, infection, and immunologic or endocrine factors. Now, APA 
antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Um, some women have lupus, which produces anti-cardiolipin antibody that leads to thrombosis of the fetal placental vasculature, resulting in SAB, or spontaneous abortion again. Now, second trimester uh, SABs are not commonly associated with chromosomal abnormalities. They're more commonly associated with maternal, uterine, and cervical abnormalities. So second trimester is more commonly associated with maternal uterine and cervical and cervical abnormalities and maternal diseases and trauma. So that's what you think about when you think about the second trimester. Um, an underlying uh, cause cannot be determined in many uh, SAB cases. So spontaneous abortion, also known as a miscarriage, um, is defined as a pregnancy that is lost before 20 weeks pregnant. So less than 20 weeks is called an abortion. That's big. Remember that. It's less than 20 weeks. Now, a SAB is classified by the passage of products of conception, which is called POC, products of conception, um, through the cervix and the dilatation status of the cervix. Now, hint, vowels go together. If the type of SAB begins with a vowel, incomplete or inevitable, the cervix status starts with a vowel, open. So, you can get a put... Actually, we're going to write all these in. Let's get us a new sheet of paper here. So, you can have a complete abortion. An incomplete abortion. Inevitable abortion, a threatened abortion, or a missed abortion. Now, I'm going to give you a really easy way to remember these. We're going to keep it as simple as possible. So, a complete abortion is a POMC that's completely passed, so the cervix is closed. The cervix is closed. Now, in an incomplete abortion, the POC is partially passed. And the cervix is open in an incomplete abortion. Now, in an inevitable abortion, the POC is in the uterus. and the cervix is open. Now, threatened abortion, um, the POC is in the uterus. The cervix is closed. The cervix is closed. It's a viable pregnancy with bleeding, a threatened abortion. Now, a missed abortion is death of the fetus with POC in the uterus.
Um, the cervix is closed. Cervix is closed. So the only two where the cervix is open is incomplete abortion and inevitable abortion. The two that end in I, both the cervix is open, uh, is open. And the other three, the complete, the threatened, and the missed abortion, the cervixes are all closed. Okay? And in the uterus, there's three of them um, where the POC is, and that is inevitable, threatened, and missed abortion. So these aren't that bad if you just sit down and take some time with them. Okay, so let's go back to the slide before. Now, how do you diagnose this? The diagnosis, the most common clinical presentation is vaginal bleeding during the first trimester. Vaginal bleeding during the first trimester. Other symptoms include cramping, pain, and loss of pregnancy symptoms, such as, uh, or, or, yeah, like nausea. Now, the speculum exam is indicated and may reveal bleeding from the os and or cervical dilation. A quantitative HCG, let's be thorough here, HCG, CBC, and blood type. blood type and antibody screening should be ordered. An ultrasound is useful in assessing fetal, fetal viability and or the presence of products of conception. Now, so how do we treat this bad boy? Well, treatment depends on the patient's preference and bleeding status. The first priority is to always stabilize a bleeding patient. A complete, a complete abortion POC should be sent to pathology and the woman monitored for signs of infection and recurrent bleeding. Now, if the patient is stable, an incomplete, inevitable, or missed abortion, let me repeat this. If a woman is stable, let's get us a new page here. If stable and incomplete, inevitable, or missed, abortion can be monitored in one of three ways of the patient's preference. Number one. You can do it expectantly. Number two, with prostaglandins to induce uh, dilatation and contractions. And number three, with D and C in the first trimester or D and E in the second trimester. So that right there is the three ways um, that if a patient is stable, an incomplete and inevitable or missed abortion can be monitored in one of three ways by the patient's preference. Now, a threatened abortion a threatened abortion should be managed with pelvic rest should be monitored with pelvic rest and the patient should be monitored for continued bleeding. Now, Rogam, the good old Rogam should be given to all RH negative women with vaginal bleeding. That's kind of obvious. I'm not even going to write that in there. Any RH negative woman 
that has not had a baby may have an RH positive fetus, which means that 85% of people are RH positive. So the odds are nine out of 10, just about, that she's going to have an RH positive baby. Well, the problem is some of those antibodies, the baby having, um, she can develop anti, um, I, anti um, RH positive antibodies. And the second baby she has, if it's RH negative and those antibodies cause the placenta, bada bing, there you go. So that's why we get Rogan. Now, the recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, um, a diagnosis given to a woman who has had three or more consecutive SABs. So the ideology of recurrent pregnancy loss is similar to that of SAB, with 15% having APA syndrome, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Others may have a luteal phase defect or have an inadequate progesterone to su uh, sustain the pregnancy. The workup should include measuring serum progesterone levels in the luteal phase. So to work them up, measure serum progesterone levels in the luteal phase. In the luteal phase, karyotyping of the parents, karyotyping of the parents, a hist a history a hysteriosalpingogram to determine maternal anatomy. And screening for hypothyroidism. Um, diabetes mellitus. Um, ASA. SLE. And coagulopathies. And that right there is the workup for measuring how we do this in recurrent pregnancy loss. So that pretty much covers um, all the complications of pregnancy and obstetrics that you will see on step two um, or for your reproductive um, class.